There is no presentation to watch. So we're just going to get do some applied stuff. We're going to answer some questions. We're going to talk about eccentric overload training. Okay. Um, the cool thing is about we'll get some people also up to kind of help demonstrate and do some different activities here. But essentially, this fills a gap in training. And that's what eccentric training does. And I'm not talking about eccentric training from a standpoint of lifting weights. Uh, the, the typical one-to-one, -one, the concentric, I can go down slow, not changing time under tension or anything like that. What we're talking about is an eccentric overload. So can we decelerate large amounts of weight in a short period of time? And really, what does that bring us? Okay. So if we're talking about an eccentric contraction, really, what is an eccentric contraction? It's when a muscle contracts while it's lengthening. Okay, that's just the basic stuff, we know that. So in other words, the muscle is not able to handle the load being placed upon it, so it's contracting while it's lengthening. Well, the term is a negative, right? And there's an eccentric component to everything. There's an eccentric component to every sport, even running and sprinting, right? There is eccentric from preventing rotation. Anything that creates stability has an eccentric component. Anything with blocking, eccentric component. Movement in a tennis court, eccentric component, right? Any type of cutting and deceleration, eccentric component. Hitting a baseball, there is an eccentric component. Pitching, there is an eccentric component. So it really doesn't matter what it is, eccentric uh, muscle activation always plays a role. So what is the benefit to doing this, right? Now I want to clear up one misconception right away. And everybody always equates soreness with eccentrics, right? Because that's what they teach you in ex-phys class. They say, well, if you do eccentric training, you're going to get sore, OK? And that is a little bit true, but there's also some myth behind that. There is this thing called the repeated bout effect. And what the repeated bout effect is, it's actually a protective mechanism. And it's a protective restructuring within the muscle physiology. And what that does is that if you perform one bout of eccentric training, it actually protects you from soreness in subsequent bouts. So you might be sore once the first time, but if you continue to perform that same type of movement, then you do not get sore anymore. Okay, so that's something to keep in mind. So people who tend to shy away from eccentric training in season, it's actually not a good thing. Okay, because you can actually use this from a protective benefit from the eccentric or deceleration components. And that's really where this plays into it. If you have to decelerate movements, this is essential. So why is this essential? Well, if you decelerate a movement, you're counting on the muscle to dissipate forces, muscle and tendon, right? If you have forces that are greater than what the muscle and tendon can handle, those forces have to go somewhere. Where do they go? Cartilage? ligament, bone, and other soft tissues, and that's where bad crap happens, okay? If you do not have a muscle that can handle those forces, something else has to pick up the slack, and those structures, ligaments, bone, and cartilage, are not meant to dissipate greater amounts of force. So there's a huge injury potential aspect of using this. So, what does eccentric training look like? There's a lot of variation you can do. There's a lot of things that you can do with this piece of equipment here, the VersaPulley, that makes it very applicable. Essentially what it is with a flywheel is I have a concentric contraction. So I'm pulling, whoops. So I'm pulling with this. Then those forces are now imparted and pushed into the flywheel. Now that creates inertia. So now my body is responsible for slowing down the inertia, okay? And that's what that creates that eccentric overload. So the harder I pull, the greater amounts of force I have to decelerate. Okay? You look athletic. Why don't you come up here for a second? Now, if he says no, he's saying he's not athletic. So I just completely called him out. <laughs> then I'm going to get my my I'm going to get my marine up here too. A little bit later. Hang on, you can hang tight. Okay. So just go ahead and just hop on here and just kind of pull back and forth. Yeah, we all, yeah, just hang on. And just get used to it. Just kind of pull it, kind of feel it go back and forth. And what you're going to see, and really you have to feel it. I should say this. Over at the VersaPulley booth, they're running a competition, right? Who can pull the hardest? So the number one prize is 
50% off of Versapulli if you pull the hardest. So they have a male category and a female category. Second place prize, $100 gift card. Third place prize, $50 gift card, right? Just if you can crank on it and pull it, let's see what kind of numbers you can generate. So what my friend's gonna do here, I just want you to try and do a row, okay? So I want you to stay tight, lock in here, I want you to pull back and try and decelerate. If you want to stagger your stance, you can, but I want you to think about pulling and decelerating and slowing it down, okay? So just get used to that type of work. And the harder you pull, the harder it's going to be to slow down. Good, give it a yank, pull. There you go, big pull, you feel that? So there's a couple things you can do. One, he's pulling. The other thing I can do with this is I can put another uh, handle on here and I can pull with him. So now all of a sudden it's coach assisted. So now there's two concentric pulls and now he has to decelerate both of, our, both of that work, okay? And that's a huge component. Now, uh, where's my Marine? Thank you. So he's leading the pack in the male pull right now. So I want you to do what you're doing before. Really yank and pull. So he's gonna get it going here. So now he's squatting, he can take it to even a lower body movement. So now it's lower body initiating. He's pushing and pulling. And rest, great job. Awesome job, Semper Fi, devil dog, okay? So what we're doing here is now he's incorporating the lower body. So he's loading the lower body, he's generating. So it's not an upper body exercise anymore, it's a lower body. Very similar to what we're talking about with a clean or a jerk. I'm not saying it has the same explosiveness and same transfer, but what I'm saying is the same thing where it's a full body initiated exercise, okay? Uh, he can take that, we can even go with uh, utilizing the belt. Compliments have performed better. There's another plug. So we put the belt on here. And again, this does not have to be sports specific. All it has to be is sports transferable. Okay, so many times we look at trying to get the exact same motion of a sport, and we don't need to get the same motion of a sport, right? It just has to be transferable. So anything with deceleration, we can take a step back and step into it. So I'm stepping back and now I have to stop as I go forward in a forward lunge. I could even take it to a side lunge if I'm loading here and pushing and extending. Stop and decelerate, load, push, load, push. I could take the same thing to a backward lunge where I'm stepping forward and now I have to decelerate backwards. So as you can see, the possibilities are endless with this. And there's a lot of eccentric training products out there, right? But most of them only give you the vertical component. Can I squat and stand up? Maybe I could do like some sort of lateral lunge. But at the end of the day, this gives you a horizontal component. And that's essential for change of direction. Any type of movement exercise, there's a rehabilitation component. Uh, there's a recovery component. The thing about eccentric training also you need to know, there's less metabolic effort, okay? So that means is that the metabolic cost of doing an eccentric exercise is about six times lower than doing a concentric exercise. So you're not spending or expending as much energy doing eccentric. So if you wanted to in season, you could do a coach assisted only. So have the coach pull and have the athletes decelerate and they're spending less metabolic work. The other thing is you can generate greater amounts of force and the research is very clear on this, right? And that says that I could generate three and a half to six times more force than a concentric contraction. What does that mean? It means I get stronger faster. It means I can develop power faster. It doesn't mean I'm gonna get rid of all my racks and put all of these in, no. What it means is this fills a gap. Because again, going back to ex-phys class, what do they teach you? They teach you that force velocity curve, right? But that's just what? The concentric side. They forget to teach you this other half, which is the eccentric side. So if we're not training this aspect, we're leaving something on the table. We're leaving something on the table for our athletes, and we're leaving something on the table in terms of improving their performance and decreasing their injury potential. And that's really what it comes down to, okay? Um, Do we bring a cable bar? Do we have a cable bar, Brett? The bar? Do you have a bar? Yeah, could you grab it? 
So I'll show you a bar. We'll do some other ones. We'll have some people come up here and give it a try. Um, now, the nice thing about this is we don't have it plugged in right now because I didn't need it plugged in. But it does give you a readout in terms of inertial power. So you can actually quantify movement, right? You can quantify exactly how much power these people are generating, which is nice. Because in the world of big data, in the world of measuring everything under the sun, including eye color, yes, you actually can measure something that means something here, which is actually nice. So it'll give you a readout in terms of how much power um, you guys are, are generating here. Um, you can change the amount of resistance on here pretty easily. Right? But the thing that I really like about this the most is that, again, it's self-regulating. So as strong as my athletes are, that's as hard as it will pull. Right? So whatever I'm pulling with my strength is what it's going to respond. If I have somebody who's stronger, they're going to get more out of it. If I have somebody who's weaker, they're going to get the same, same response, but based upon their own level of strength. So it's self-regulating. Okay? Now, one of the questions people ask is, well, is there any way of getting this type of movement without this type of equipment? And there is, right? I can stand, sit boxes up really high, and I can jump off boxes onto the ground. Thank you. OK? So I, I can take weights on somebody's back, and I can push them down as hard as I can, and they can decelerate it. But there's a huge risk. People are going to get hurt, and that's not a good thing. The nice thing about this is that it eliminates that, that risk. So it's all you get is reward, OK? Um, this is another exercise if you have any athlete who deals a lot with rotation. And again, I think uh, since most sports, if not all sports, have some degree of rotation, this is applicable. We'll get some people up to try this. Make this cable a little longer. There we go. So with this, it's just going to be a push type of pull exercise. So I'm going to pull the weight, and I'm going to end up pivoting at the end. So I'm reaching, and I'll pivot through. So I can reach and load, push through, reach and load, push. Reach and load, push. So all of a sudden, now I'm getting a rotational component. So if we break down that movement, what am I getting? I'm getting a loaded component here. So now this is not only developing strength, but it's putting my body in a position to generate force. And it's putting my body in a position to utilize movement better. If we teach speed and movement and multi-directional uh, enhancement, we know that we need to put weight on the inside ball of the foot. We need to know that we need to drop our knee inside our toe to create leverage. And stopping this weight and loading it puts me in that position. So I get almost a free speed session every time I utilize this. So I'm loading here. Now I'm teaching myself how to push and extend out of my hip. So I'm pushing and driving. Hip extension is great, but most times what plane do we work in? Right here. Which is not bad, but again, is it sports transferable. Well, I think this is, and I also think this is. So again, now I'm able to get this rotational benefit. I'm pushing and extending. I'm also creating mobile scap. I'm creating reciprocal movement, left arm, right leg, which is fantastic. Now I'm pushing, rotating, and finishing with a drive, right? And I don't have to decelerate the weight. That's the whole premise of Olympic lifting, right? Is that I can generate greater amounts of force and tons of force, but not decelerate the weight. So I have something now that I can do the same thing, generate, not decelerate. Now I'm also getting an eccentric loading at the bottom. What's the eccentric loading doing? It's changing my stiffness of my muscle. My muscle's becoming stiffer. Stiffness is a good thing, because the role of an eccentric contraction is twofold. Number one, it absorbs and decelerates forces. Remember, if you don't have enough decelerative protection in your muscle, what happens? Ligaments, bone, cartilage take up that, and that's not good, right? The other purpose of an eccentric contraction is the preload, is loading. It acts as a spring. So it acts as a break, and right before concentric motion, it acts as a spring. So the greater eccentric strength I have, the greater amount of force production I can produce in a shorter period of time. And anybody who works in athletics 
tactical or otherwise, knows that he or she who can generate the greatest amount of force in the shortest wins the game. If I'm going up against somebody, if it's a block, in football, it doesn't matter what it is, if I can generate more force than my opponent in a shorter period of time, I win. So that's what it's all about. So uh, let's have somebody else come. You want to try? Come on up, give it a whirl. Oh man, how are we doing? Good to see you again. Let me make this just a little bit longer for you. So what I have you do is just what I did here. So you're gonna reach. We'll get to the end range first, so we'll find out where it is right here. So that's where I want you to finishing. So we'll stop here, and then we'll let it coil up. And then I would just take a few reps to get used to it. Where you're reaching here, push, pivot, and drop. So sink, and then push. Okay. I'll keep it kind of going for you here. There you go. Go ahead and take it. Use both hands here. And there is a learning curve, right? And it will pull you back too, and that's the thing. When people get on here, they're like, holy crap, this pulls me back. Exactly, the harder you pull, the more it's gonna give into you. Push and drive. Good. Push and pivot. Good, finish all the way around. Batter. Do one more. Awesome. And rest. Good. Thanks. I'll give him a round of applause because that was good. Right? And he's going to be sore. He will be sore tomorrow, right? Remember, he will create soreness, but only once. Now, if I do something that's out of pattern, which means it's an exercise that I haven't done before and I introduce it, then I'm going to have some residual soreness as well. But to think that it's going to cause soreness long term, no. It's actually a protective effect from the remodeling of the muscle. So it's pretty cool stuff that it can do. Okay? Um, again, possibilities are endless. You can hook, hook the belt up. You can put a, uh, like a, sometimes I'll put a bike or something out in front and I'll actually load and push and extend on 45 degrees. So now I have applicability to anybody in starts or might need to work with starting strength or something along those lines. So there's an, an, an innumerable amount of exercises that you can utilize and perform with this. And again, it's applicable to any population, right? You can use it in the rehab setting. You can use it in the performance setting. You can use it just about anywhere to enhance performance and decrease injury potential. Remember, again, it's not a replacement for anything. It is to fill in a gap that we have in our current systems of training, right? And that's where the magic happens. If you evaluate your programs and take a look from a systematic approach of your programs, and you can determine, well, I'm missing this huge part, why would you not want to add that into your programs? Because that's where the good stuff happens. It's usually in what am I not doing if I add that in that I will get a great benefit from it. Okay, and that's what this does. Remember, it handles that part of the strength curve, which we do not typically train. We get increased strength, increased power in a shorter period of time. And all of these benefits only happen at a minimum of 45% of maximal contraction. You do not have to work that hard. The research is very clear. 45% of maximal eccentric contraction will get you the protective benefits of the repeated bout effect. It'll get you the increased power. It'll get you the increased strength. It'll get you those remodeling of the myofilaments to give you better stiffness, not decrease in flexibility, but better stiffness and also better spring. Okay, so again, I encourage you guys, that's it for me, I'm out of time now, but I encourage you guys, 20 minute talk, to go over to the Versa Play booth, pull on it. Worst case scenario, if you get best, you get 50% off. If you get second, you get 100 bucks, not bad. And third, you get 50 bucks. And then it, and I get to meet you, which is also pretty cool, okay? So I'll be here hanging out if you have any other questions. I appreciate your guys' time, thank you.